Okay, good morning. I'm surprised you guys came. This is not very crowded. Looks like there is already a new generation who never ever heard about UC Lipc, so probably nobody just knows what is that. So anyway, so uh, there is such a thing. Uh, it used to be uh, quite popular uh, C library, and so uh, it still exists. And I think that's quite alive and kicking. So let me start my presentation then. Uh, my name is Alexey Brodkin. Uh, today I'm going to talk about UC Libc, one of the implementation of a standard Linux uh, library, uh, C libraries for Linux. Unfortunately, popularity of that uh, C library uh, decreased quite a lot uh, in last years because of mostly non-technical reasons. But for me, like a heavy user of that thing today, uh, I do believe that uh, now it is in much better shape in, uh, compared to what it used to be before. Uh, just a little bit of my background, I work for Synopsys in St. Petersburg, Russia, and my main responsibility in Synopsys is to make sure that our development systems run Linux kernel and uh, the whole zoo of different applications on top of that smoothly. And for that, I need first build that uh, stuff and then make sure it runs. And that's how I got into the business of UC libc, because historically, the only uh, C library that we used to have, it was UC libc. Today, we have glibc port, but for a long time, it was the only option. And uh, that's how I got uh, quite a lot of experience with UC libc, and uh, that was my actual inspiration to share my experience with audience today. Uh, so uh, first, uh, uh, first thing I want to do, I want to, uh, to figure out how many of you actually uh, realize what is a C library and so why it is really needed. So anybody? Like two, three, four, okay. Cool, that's promising. Okay, so then uh, those of you who really know what is that, do you really guys know uh, what kind of C library is used on your development target? Anyone? Oh, cool. So, okay, so those who know what is that, so they know what kind of library is used. Okay, and uh, then how many of you use uh, glibc on your target development system? Okay, pretty much. The, okay, so probably next questions don't make really sense, but anyways, I'll try. So what about Musil? Somebody uses that? Well, about 10 persons. Okay, so then very next question. Anybody you using UC libc? Oh, actually, it is like on par with Musil, so that's promising. Cool, I didn't expect that. And probably after my presentation, that uh, distribution will change a little bit again. So uh, what are we going to have today? It will be a high-level overview of uh, what is UC libc, uh, some uh, notes about history, what we used to have and what we have now, current state, uh, who uses, who dropped usage of UC libc, and uh, then will be the most interesting technical part. So we'll go through a couple of uh, situations uh, which UC libc user may bump into, not necessarily, but uh, that might happen easily. And so just to make sure that uh, we are on the same page, so I think that will be of interest for those who are supports uh, embedded Linux distributions and build systems, essentially, because that's one of the options that you may use. Uh, the other category of people, those uh, users like we used to be in Arc, uh, who have no other choice, like you have UC libc or nothing, and that's why you have to use that. And so in the end, so all the uh, curious uh, embedded in Linux developers uh, who, who may just be interested in something new or something old in the verse. Uh, so uh, let's start. And actually, I want to start from a couple of fun facts that I discovered for myself during preparation of that presentation. So uh, probably most of you know about BusyBox, which is like a Swiss army knife uh, of embedded Linux. And that uh, package of utilities was created by the same guy, Eric Anderson. But what was interesting for me, it was created before UC libc. So uh, that was the first uh, step to getting something small and still running. The other project is Buildroot, which is widely known today. And again, it was started by Eric Anderson, and it was just a test bed so for UC libc, like, okay, may I run, build and run that application, this application? And today, uh, we use it for same purpose as well, but mainly this is like a major build system for deeply embedded systems, and I use it a lot. And now you may sort of test not only UC libc, but Musil and glibc anyway. So that turned to be pretty much uh, uh, not, not the worst test bed, probably one of the best. Uh, so uh, what is also interesting, those uh, two creations of Eric Anderson are much, much more popular than UC libc. Buildroot is used widely, as well as BusyBox, which is used even more than Buildroot, I guess. Uh, then there is another project, OpenWRT, or uh, known now like uh, lead project. Uh, they use Buildroot as their uh, build system, even though it is heavily patched, but still that's 
the regions are pretty much the same, and uh, that's uh, that's quite interesting. So again, uh, something which started as a testbed for UCLC ended up as a build system for major uh, distribution for wireless routers, for example. And there is another project which is called UCLC++, which has uh, nothing to do with UCLC. It was written by a different person, uh, but uh, with the same goal to get a very simple, a very small implementation of C++ library for small targets. And I was surprised that it is actually used in uh, that OpenWRT thingy uh, together with our smaller C libraries like Musl or UCLC. And another fun fact, uh, most of them except uh, OpenWRT are hosted in the same Git repo, so that's interesting. Okay, so uh, what is UCLibc? Uh, I would say that UCLibc is just a compact C library for Linux kernel that used to be de facto standard for embedded systems. Uh, key benefits are it supports a lot of different architectures. Uh, it is very highly configurable, and it has quite small memory footprint, which we may reduce even further uh, if we start to deconfigure that, disable like networking, threading, or some pr probably uh, more subtle options. Uh, and in general, I think uh, from practical standpoint, all we want from libc is to provide uh, just a pretty much correct implementation of some standard functions of our platform. But I'm saying uh, some, but not all, uh, because we have way too many different standards we may want to confirm. Like there is POSIX, so different versions of C, System V, XPG, XSI, and we cannot be completely complete because next year emerges the next standard we want to comply with. But in the end, what we want, we want to have our application on our uh, target system to be built and run. And for that, we may have enough in any uh, implementation of libc, especially in UC libc. And why it is important so, to have support for our platform, that's quite obvious as well, because uh, C libraries in between user space applications and Linux kernel, and it talks to Linux kernel uh, through system calls, which are in its turn uh, could be initiated uh, through interrupt or exception or something like that, which means C library needs to know a lot about uh, kernel things like a kernel ABI and so uh, some specifics of your platform. And so that, that is a very typical picture you may find on Wikipedia, so how it works on high level, so you have applications, kernel, and something in between, which could be sort of uh, bypassed, but not, not really bypassed, because UCLibc anyways provides a wrappers for even uh, system calls, because it is uh, much easier, and applications don't need to know uh, a lot about uh, specifics of the kernel. And when I, was, uh, uh, when I was preparing for this presentation, I wanted to have some example. OK, so there is a simple uh, function REST needs, or something else. Uh, which uh, produces quite a lot of system calls. And the one uh, that I tried first was resting it. Okay, that, this is straightforward. Uh, as it is said in manage, you just read uh, resolve.conf. And so uh, that's pretty much it. But, and it was fine. Okay, so there is a stat, so we are checking if that exists. Then we open, read, and then close. But what the heck is get bit here? And then I realized that, oh, well, that's interesting. That's how we are getting some random ID. Uh, you may see it on the left. Uh, that's a real code from UCLibc, and what is even funny, glibc has exactly the same code. So either that function is not used or this ID is not uh, really important. But that kind of uh, random values, so uh, I think, not really random. Uh, another piece of information in Musl, they, in Resini, they don't do nothing. They just uh, return zero, that's it. So probably it is more secure, I don't know. So now uh, so let's take an, a historical overview from very first commit uh, to, uh, to what we have now in the master branch of UCLibc. Uh, so it all started by uh, Eric Anderson uh, in an attempt to create the smallest fully functional uh, C library for Linux. That's how he answered uh, to one of the questions back in the day. Uh, he started in uh, 2000, so uh, year 2000, from quite simple x86 uh, ports, adding more features and architectures later. Essentially, it was not only him who was adding that uh, more features and architectures. More people got involved with time, and it became quite a big project. Uh, at some point, uh, in around uh, 2008, maintainership was uh, handed over to Bernard Rutner Fisher, who was quite active until uh, mid-2012. 
but uh, the problem started later when he seemed to lost interest uh, to the project and uh, only once in a while so accepted commits in the master branch but never cut a new release. So that was a real pain. For example, by that time uh, in build 2015, I guess, uh, for UCLPC we had uh, about 70 patches and so uh, two other architectures came from a separate JIT repositories which was just because we didn't want to add another like 20 or 30 patches on top of those 70, so get 100 of them. Uh, essentially, community tried to, to, to call maintainership, but uh, well, burnout was not that uh, that's easy to communicate with. Uh, let's put it like that. Uh, so uh, now what's happened, uh, one guy, uh, Valdemar Brodkorp, uh, decided to start a fork, and that's what he did. He took basically a master branch of UCLIPC and uh, put it in a different uh, Git repository and uh, started to maintain that. And uh, it's turned out to be a very, uh, very good initiative, actually, because since then we are seeing uh, regular releases every couple of months. And so uh, not only releases, uh, every time release happens, Valdemar runs full uh, UCLPC test suite, uh, which exposes all the regressions or improvements, uh, so it is very handy. Uh, so what do we have now uh, compared to uh, where uh, Bernard left it? Uh, as of today, uh, we see significant uh, improvements in that project. So for example, a lot of cleanup was done. We removed so six different architectures which were either broken, so you were not able to build that, or for example, uh, you can build that but it won't run, or even worse, you don't have a target, neither uh, simulation, simulation engine or real hardware. So there, there was no point to support that thing. So they were removed and so uh, code became a little bit cleaner. Uh, quite a lot of configuration options so were removed, even though uh, you, like, you see if this model is we are configurable, but this causes way too much pain for maintainers, users, and developers. So some of them which are not really important and so uh, they only may contribute to like reduction of a couple of bytes or a couple of lines of codes, they were just removed. Uh, that made it usually more compatible, uh, more uh, maintainable, for example. Uh, another thing which happens, we uh, merged uh, together a lot of different libraries like libRT, libutil, and uh, all the others to the single one uh, library file which again uh, made code a little bit, uh, well, quite actually uh, significantly cleaner and so uh, more compact and so uh, it is uh, easier to be used now. But with that, uh, we've got a couple of uh, other major changes. So ABI changed it uh, when we bumped version from 0 0.9 uh, to 1 dot something. Uh, essentially, uh, library names are now different and that causes some problems which I'm going to address a little bit later. Uh, and also then we merged libraries all together, and that's another piece of the story. Uh, what else? Uh, now we have support of more architectures, which is also beneficial, and some of them, for example, 64-bit ARM, this is very nice because so uh, this is very merging and uh, interesting architecture, and now you may use it with UCLIPC, so why not? Some others like uh, Lattice uh, Micro something on Andes and uh, Spark 64, they are also nice. Uh, also, um, PTL support was then uh, added to uh, MicroBlaze and Extensa, which means a wide range of different applications could be used on these platforms from now on. In my opinion, that is very cool. And another significant improvement is Test Suite was first separated from UCLT sources and then uh, reworked. And uh, that rework included not only cleanups and uh, ma minor fixes, but entire uh, wrapper which was used for uh, execution of that test bench was modified. We switched from uh, make file, uh, make driven execution to a shell script. And the difference is very important because uh, UCLT supports no MMU targets when you, where you don't have fork. And make uses fork which, make, which means test suite is not uh, usable on no, no MMU targets. Now it is possible we have a shell script who execute it uh, like in a shell which exists on those platforms and we are getting results actually, so uh, we have now much better test coverage. Uh, and why it is important to separate it as well, so we may have a better regression testing again. We have, we may keep the same test suite, but uh, change uh, versions of C library, or we may uh, change uh, test suite versions and keep C library the same. So uh, that's nice. Uh, those options, for example, that were removed, uh, so was support of large file system. Okay, now we have it enabled by default because 
it didn't contribute a lot uh, to tenification of the library, but uh, it was a problem to because every time you don't have it, you need to rebuild it. So that was a nightmare. Some glibc configuration options and some options related to uh, execution, actually uh, dealing with modules of 2.6 kernel, which probably, well, not nobody, but uh, not very widely used today. So that, that I think, was fine. So uh, what is the current state who uses uh, UCLC today and who does not? The major user by far is Buildroots, actually, where it is the default uh, C library for most of the architectures, for basically, for uh, which it works. And Buildroots is interesting in that regard because we have uh, about 2,000 different packages, and most of that, them could be built and run with UCLC, which gives us the answer of that. OK, practically speaking, that you see, uh, that C library implementation is quite complete because we may build a lot of different things and run them, essentially with some quirk, with some fixed subs, but we'll talk about it a little bit later. So, but anyways, coverage is quite good. Another uh, quite interesting example, which I didn't uh, know exists before I started to prepare to that presentation, is uh, Lil Blue Gentoo. So basically, this is a normal full-scale uh, distribution uh, targeted uh, for 64-bit x86 machine we are normally XFCE uh, for based uh, desktop. So this is completely different uh, other well, parts, uh, other side of the spectrum. This is uh, not for embedded. This is for like normal desktop thingy. And there it is used as well. And that's also, I think, uh, tells something. Uh, so that library is not that bad. Uh, there is another project, OpenIDK, uh, which builds uh, firmwares for digital appliances. And uh, this one is interesting because uh, with that, you may build a lot of, uh, of firmwares for, for non-MU targets, uh, which is not possible with most, most of the other C libraries. With GLIPC, not possible at all. With Musl, we have very limited support of non-MMU targets. Uh, another thing is OpenWRT, where it is used for our architecture. Uh, basically, we don't have Musl, so OK, we use R, but we use uh, UCLIPC, but still, uh, we may build and run a lot of packages, uh, which gives us an answer. OK, that, that's not bad, actually. Uh, UCLIPC is in a, in a good shape. Uh, and essentially, there are architectures uh, which are lacking support of any other LIPC, and we used to be one of them. It's not now, but OK. If you are in that uh, camp, you, you have no other option. Uh, so what is not that nice? Uh, essentially, there are major product, uh, projects which drop support of uh, UCLIPC. So the first is Alpine Linux. Uh, they did it back in 2014 uh, and switched to Musl. Okay, but they support only I think x86 and probably ARM. So that's not a big deal. Uh, uh, then uh, they came OpenWRT, where they decided to drop UCLIPC again in 2015. And you see these, this happens all uh, after that problem when we are having a period of no release for a couple of years. So people decide, OK, we don't want uh, to mess with all that. We don't want to support a lot of different of the two patches. OK, so there is another alternative, which has pretty much the same memory footprints, uh, not bad functionally. And so they switch to, uh, to muscle. And finally, Open Embedded switched to that, to decided to get rid of UCLIPC as well. Uh, nobody complained, and so that was a kind of a problem, and is kind of a problem for us UCLIPC users, because we uh, created Open Embedded port a little bit too late, like this summer. Otherwise, uh, probably it would have been us uh, who complained, but OK, anyways. Uh, so uh, now I'd like to compare it a little bit uh, with major other major players or major C libraries. It will be quite brief comparison because, because of two reasons. So uh, in deep comparison takes a lot of time, and I don't have it here in that time slot. And so uh, we have already a couple of uh, different comparisons, uh, different works that might be used as a good, very good reference. So what do we have in that area? We basically have glibc for a desktop and laptop uh, and uh, server type of applications. We have uclibc and muscle for more like embedded uh, uh, solutions where we are restricted on size, for example. Uh, and that's, uh, and you see a couple of links uh, where you may find uh, more in-depth or, or study of that thing. So uh, what I think are key uh, factors uh, when you are selecting C library. So these are three, in my, in my opinion. First is architecture support, then the memory footprint, and then license. Essentially, there are many more, but I'd say they are sort of a secondary. Architecture support is important so for quite clean reason. If you don't have support of that, of your architecture, of your targets, you may you like uh, glibc a lot, but you won't be able to use that. And uclibc is by far the uh, library which supports 
way too many uh, different uh, quite exotic sometimes architectures compared to GLIPC and Musil as well. Uh, as we are talking about uh, sizes, if you are in embedded uh, type of application, so then you don't want to lose another two megabytes of uh, memory just because uh, there is a full scale UCLIPC. Most probably you're looking at UCLIPC or Musil. But beauty of uh, UCLIPC, if you don't want uh, networking and threading, you are even twice slimmer, which is, I think, quite good. Uh, and licenses, if you may afford uh, having UCLIPC and don't care about obligations, okay, you take it. Otherwise, so you have some, some restrictions. Uh, so now take, uh, let's uh, uh, get to the most interesting technical part of that presentation. So what kind of situation user of UCLIPC may bump into? Uh, the first problem is UCLIPC is not backward compatible. That it was never, it, it never was and will never be probably. It has no stable APIs and that means you have to be careful and every time you update UCLIPC version, the best thing to do is basically to rebuild everything from scratch. That's how you're uh, escaping problems with their dependencies. And so uh, we had a couple of them, like changing version number, or changing libraries from different uh, other diff amount of different so libraries to uh, one library. So uh, if you have binaries that were linked against previous version of UCLIPC, they are not usable any, any longer because they want to load uh, library which doesn't exist on your file system. Uh, the other problem is actually not a problem of UCLIPC, but it is like, okay, uh, application developers, uh, they only think about uh, stuff they use. So if they use GLIPC, they uh, will think about GLIPC and nothing about anything else. So in UCLIPC, we wanted to mimic uh, some version of GLIPC uh, and to be sort of compatible with everything. With everything. But the point is uh, our feature set is differs a little bit, so which means in some cases when we are trying to make that also to the 2 GLIPC, we may not get something that we want. So we decide, okay, we update a minor version to something more recent, and we did that, but the next day we realized we did it. We'd better not do that because we faced another problem when uh, there was a feature which is missing in uh, UCLIPC, which exists in that 2.10 version. So we actually reverted that back, so it was not done like that way. So what we then do, so we have a, a UCLIPC uh, defined which has in UCLIPC, so it's better to use that explicitly than we know that, okay, we are uh, having that code or code path for UCLIPC only or for UCLIPC as well. So that's, uh, that's what we need to do. And uh, if it is not done by application developer, we need to do it ourselves. Uh, so uh, what other things? Uh, again, there are a lot of assumptions. So if it is not only GLIPC, OK, I assume networking is, al is always there, IPv6, locales, and some other fancy stuff. But with UCLIPC, it is not always the case. We may have something if we uh, have it configured. But we may down-configure that, and we don't have that feature. Or something like libNSL or NSS, they don't exist in UCLIPC and never will be, because these are uh, deprecated features, which actually shouldn't be in GLIPC as well. Uh, but it is still there because so a lot of some people use that and GLIPC developers don't want to break those user experience. Okay, so we need to live with that and for that uh, we need so, to somehow accommodate it. And the best way essentially to do is on the side of application and because there are tools like Automake or CMake which may test if you have access uh, to that particular symbol, if you have uh, this uh, header installed on, in your C root or on your target, if you may uh, link with some library. So if that check is is possible, then it's good. We don't need anything. Otherwise, we need to implement something ourselves, like disable some option uh, ex explicitly, uh, and so then usually that change could be upstreamed, but not always, essentially. Uh, what else? Uh, UCLIPC doesn't support versioning of symbols. That's clear, because we are small. We don't want to have all this uh, hustle. And that could be a problem again in some cases. In some cases, so there are problems during building. Sometimes there's problems during execution. So again, if there is a way to disable that uh, straight from the very beginning application, we just disable that. Or uh, we may test if we are on this UCLIPC, it could be disabled. If that uh, possibility doesn't exist, OK, so then we need to do something about that and either ask the developer to implement that or implement that ourselves and pass it to the developer. And probably the uh, last thing I want to mention here Probably most of you know about undefined behavior, so that's a huge thing. Uh, everybody got uh, hit by that thing at some point, and so with UCLIPC, we are seeing that thing again. Uh, and the typical example, for example, uh, uh, it was uh, allocation of uh, memory for uh, over size zero. It is not so explicitly uh, described what uh, should happen in that case, because probably it should not happen at all. 
but uh, behavior of uclibc used to be different from default uh, glibc behavior. Uh, we returned uh, not zero null and uh, some error code. In the case of glibc, some valid uh, pointer was uh, returned. Okay, so uh, we actually saw a couple of problems during runtime, and the problem is you are not seeing that in build time you will build everything fine, but in runtime you are getting a different uh, execution of your code, and you are sort of surprised. So what's wrong with that? Uh, but when you discover, uh, you may fix it. But anyways, we decided, okay, that's uh, not very important, so we may just uh, sort of submit uh, to glibc, and so uh, we'll do whatever they do, and so uh, we just remove that option, which causes us problems, and now we uh, behave exactly as glibc. So uh, as a conclusion for that subsection, so uh, what do we have? You see, libc is not backward compatible, but that could be uh, uh, worked around by rebuilding everything from scratch, and for targets uh, for a uh, type of application you see libc's target is embedded type of application this is usually not a problem anyways we are usually deploying uh, one single firmware image and so that's not a problem if part of that image was only replaced or entire uh, i think it is essentially some uh, that's a problem in a uh, situation when we have a package management system like we have in openwrt or in that gentoo thingy when you want to upgrade only uclibc. For that, you will need to, to provide some hooks, like, for example, theme links and probably some other uh, tools to assist that uh, conversion. But anyways, this is doable. Uh, then another problem, uh, uclibc uh, implements a different set of features. It is not compatible to any, completely compatible to any version of glibc or, or musl, which means if uh, there is a difference, uh, and this different uh, feature set is used by some application. Uh, we will have problems uh, trying to use that with UCLIPC, but it has. It is not only a problem of UCLIPC; that's a problem for other non-standard uh, C libraries. Uh, otherwise, uh, if it is not GLIPC, most probably you will face it. Musil has exactly the same problems. Uh, and uh, another, uh, the last thing I want to highlight here, so uh, most of the problems we are seeing with uclipc are actually not in uclipc itself, but in applications which are written in uh, uh, assumption that there is only one C library. That's why I think that's good that there are different C libraries, so we may try different things, discover problems, uh, discuss them, and uh, in the end get a better applications which are suitable for running everywhere. Like you fix it with the first uh, non-standard C library, on the second one it it's, uh, works right away. So that's beneficial for everybody, I think. So what are we planning uh, to have in the foreseeable future? So the, thing, the first thing, essentially, we are going to keep support of existing things and uh, functionality. Then we want uh, to uh, uh, reduce amount of compiler warnings and uh, failing tests uh, with help of a test suite. Uh, then we want uh, to extend support of existing architecture, like at, uh, support of dynamic loader for some architectures, as well as NPTL. Uh, also, I think new architectures will be added. I know that uh, CSKY is in works, and uh, in a couple of uh, weeks or months, it will hit upstream. So what will be my conclusion? I, for me, it is quite uh, simple. UCLIPC makes sense again, because now it is much better shaped than three or four years ago, and we have more architecture supported. We have more fe uh, features, and uh, we use it a lot in our projects, and it's pretty happy with that. Other, uh, otherwise, I may have uh, that kind of summary. So UCLIPC is a mature and pretty complete implementation of standard C library, which is proven by Buildroot and uh, that Gen2. Uh, we now have predictable uh, release cycle, uh, which simplifies life for different distributions and build systems. You don't need to mess with patches. You just wait for the next release, which happens in the next month, and you are done. Uh, and so in the end, in some cases, uh, you may have no other option. For example, if you are using architecture which is not supported in glibc or musl, you use, use uclibc, that's obvious. Or if uh, you use ARM, but you want to use ARM without MMU, most probably you use uclibc as well, because otherwise it is not supported anywhere else. In some cases, uh, you may have different options. Like, for example, for embedded kind of applications, you may have musl, and it might be beneficial uh, from some point of view. But uh, still, if you are looking to a very small uh, image, probably UCLIPC might be a good choice because you may really get a very well-optimized and small image. Uh, in some situations, uh, as you saw, there could be problems when you are bumping into some issues, but most of these uh, could be overcome with uh, just uh, 
investment of some time and patience, or if even that doesn't help, just uh, send an email to application developer or developers uh, of UC Libsy to the mailing list, and uh, most probably you'll get quite a good support of uh, that quite, fr quite friendly community. That's it for my talk today. Uh, do you guys have any questions? So there is a microphone. If you want to ask something, please so you and ask. That's clear. No interest. Not convinced you see Lipsy is alive. Yeah, essentially, uh, you won't have exactly the same set of features and everything. And that's not true that you don't have those kind of applications. We have a lot of uh, single board computers which are available for like, everybody for peanuts. But still, uh, there is markets of IoT and so some uh, devices which are produced uh, in a big volumes, and there essentially will count. I may tell you because I work for a company which uh, sells, uh, which licenses CPU cores for deeply embedded solutions, like think about SD cards or something like that. Every every like byte counts there. That, that's really true. And essentially, there are many cases when you may use like gigabytes or terabytes of storage. You don't care, and so most probably you won't use UCLC there. There's no reason for that. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm not Yeah, so here it might be a little bit so more complicated because uh, so the question was uh, how it all work uh, work on extensa. The problem with extensa uh, and so that's that could be similar to arc. It is very uh, configurable uh, architecture, like core itself. You may have different other features enabled or disabled, and that's why if you don't have uh, support of uh, this and that configuration in your tool chain, in your compiler, you won't be able to, so you may compile it, but you won't be able to run that. Well, uh, here we are talking about, uh, at least it was tried on a couple of different boards. So for them, it works. Essentially, if you want uh, some exotic configuration, you will have problems. But uh, for that, you will need to get uh, that that's compiler, essentially. So yeah, that's a problem with highly configurable cores. Some default uh, thing will work. If you want something special, you need uh, to get compiler. In case of extensa, most probably you need to go to the manufacturer, and not to manufacturer, like to Cadence or who's the owner, and so ask them to get it. They will generate you headers and some libraries. and. Once you have it, it will work for you. I'll run the mic. Um, <clears throat> so I, I presume a lot of the glibc prejudice applies to muscle as well. Um, but what other, and UC libc is the, right now anyway, the only one that supports no MMU architectures. But a choice between UC Libc and Muscle Muscle is very mature at this point. What, what, why would you recommend UC Libc? Uh, well, uh, if we are talking about architectures which are supported uh, across all the libraries, that might be a tough choice. It might be like, okay, uh, I used to use UC Libc or I used to use Muscle. I don't again. Uh, I'm a very practical person, and so uh, which works for me, that's fine. If there is a reason to try something else, like it is better, it is, it has smaller memory footprint. That could be, uh, that could be a good reason. Otherwise, so uh, that's your choice. And well, actually, for a Muscle, there is, uh, there is a good reason that license. If you want uh, to do some modifications, okay, this is me, I see, okay. You do whatever you want. You tell nobody about that, and so uh, you use that with UC Libc. You can do that. Mm -hmm. You will need to. Uh, expose all your changes in the end. So yeah, that's a benefit for Muscle. Or 
for use in Libc, depending on your. Well, yeah, <laughs> depending on which size you are. If you are a commercial company, uh, it's a one point of view. From the other point of view, that's UC Libc, and I like that in UC Libc because I I, I prefer to have uh, more uh, input from users uh, to get so those changes contributed, but. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not running a huge business. Probably, otherwise, I would have another opinion on that. But you don't know of a significant size advantage to UC. Uh, one of the links uh, actually mentions uh, those articles. Uh, so one. Uh, so one is actually uh, the author of uh, Musil, uh, created a very uh, detailed comparison. Even though it's a little bit outdated, but most of the things are listed there. I mean. Uh, that one, and so another is uh, uh, like uh, probably it, it, it will answer your question a little bit better. So that's a talk from Hemraj, which will go uh, which will uh, go you through a couple of steps, uh, helping to, to select the better version of C library which suits you the best. So go check it out. Slides on the uh, Linux Foundation site, so you'll be able to use this. Okay, anybody else? Okay, so then, thank you very much for listening to that presentation.